part of that. Well, uh, we started last uh, Sunday uh, a series on, on uh, Heart for Our City. Heart for Our City. God cares for the city. God really cares for the city. The idea of city, the whole idea of that is prominent throughout your Bible, throughout your scriptures. And uh, last week we, we looked at, uh, from Jeremiah chapter 29, uh, where, where God uh, told his people, the people that previously had been living in Jerusalem, uh, to put down roots in Babylon and grow and increase there and flourish there and to pray for that city and for its prosperity because when the city prospers, the prayers that are praying for the city's prosperity will prosper also. Well, that was last week. Today is about Nineveh and God's heart for that city. Uh, and God has heart for the city that we represent here, whether it's Quinana, Rockingham, or Serpentine, or the surrounding areas, all part of our city. Uh, God wants us to have a heart for this city and the Nineveh story. God had a heart for that city. But it seems when you know that story, and most of you will if you've been hanging around church for just a little while or have a, some Sunday school or church background, uh, that that story is tied up with the prophet Jonah. He, he is, he is, his story is linked to the, the story of that city, and uh, our story gets linked and intersects with the story of Jonah and the story of Nineveh. And the book, the book of Jonah, it begins by giving us a brief uh, prophetic uh, bio or profile uh, of Jonah. Uh, Jonah 1-2, here we go. You want to know something about him? They don't tell us much, just a little bit. The word of the Lord... Well, that's verse 2. We're not up to that. We're going to do verse... The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. That's all we get. We know who his dad is. That's his, that's his profile. Do you want to know something about this guy? Well, I know his dad. I know his dad. That's, that's all we get. What you need to know that this is not the first time that Jonah has appeared in Scripture. Uh, he'd been around for a while before this book crops up in, in, your, in your Bible. We first encounter Jonah in 2 Kings 14.25 in the time of the reign of King Jeroboam, the son of Jehoash, king of Israel. What you need to know, and most people in church life don't seem to get their heads around this, that once Solomon had died, uh, uh, Israel split into two kingdoms. Kingdom of Israel to the north, capital Samaria, the king of Judah to the south, uh, capital Jerusalem. Well, Jonah is from, uh, from Israel, the capital Samaria. But when you get it in uh, two kings, one, one and two kings, they always reference the king of Israel with the king of Judah. So it goes like this. In the 15th year of Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria, and he reigned... 41 years. It wasn't a good man at all. Uh, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, a previous Jeroboam, uh, which he caused Israel to commit. He was the one, watch this, who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Dead Sea in accordance with the word of the Lord, of God, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant who? Jonah, son of Amittai. There's the dad again. Uh, the prophet from Gath, Hepha. Uh, th this, is, this is Jonah. Jonah is already a well-known person. I just want to give you the map of that area that uh, he prophesied uh, that, that, the, that Israel should take back again, someone taken off them. And when you look at this, Judah to the south and Israel the pink, and it goes right up there to the right is Damascus and Aram and another place, another city that's round about where that sign says Aram is Nineveh. And so Jonah has been prophesying that, that Israel should take back all this territory. And they took back that territory. And while it was King Jeroboam who took back the territory, it was the prophet who said he should take it back because he's supposed to be in touch with God. And so at the very beginning of the book of Jonah, God is sending the prophet north again, not to take back territory for Israel, uh, not to recapture territory from Assyria, of which Nineveh is the capital, but on a mission to call that foreign city to repentance. Jonah 1, 1 and 2. Uh, the word of the Lord... Let's go, oh, there we go. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh 
and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Always know this. God called that a great city, and God can call it a great city, but no matter how great the city is, and it, even though God says it's great, God is greater than the great city. You need to know that. Uh, well, what will Jonah do with the call of God to go to this great city and call it to repentance? Well, like a good prophet, Jonah 1.3, uh, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port and after paying the fare, he went aboard the ship and sailed for Tarshish to what? To flee from the Lord. A couple more maps for you so you get the hang of what this looked like. Uh, Nineveh, uh, Joppa, uh, Syria, Israel and the trip that Jonah is planning to go across the Mediterranean Sea to Tarshish in Spain and the fact is God brought him back to Nineveh. I think we've got a second map. Yes, we do. And there's some, if you weren't thinking in miles, that's a lot of Ks, that's all. Here is the brave prophet who prophesied that Israel should take back the territory right up to the border of Assyria and very close to the city of Nineveh. And he would take back the territory. He, 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 wouldn't, he wouldn't run away from that at all, but he would not do ministry in that place. And two things that you need to bear in mind hear about Jonah before we trace out the rest of the story about Jonah and Nineveh and the application for us. Number one, Jonah did not like the people of Nineveh. He didn't like them at all. If you can think of a particular group of people you don't like, well, Jonah felt likely is less than the particular group of people. He would take their land, but he would not do ministry among them. And number two, Jonah knew the nature of God, that he is a God of grace. Jonah 4.2. Uh, Jonah talking to God later on. Uh, he said, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. I knew that about you. I, I knew that you were a God of grace. And, and, and Lord, in other words, I don't want to go to Nineveh because I don't like these people and because you're a God of grace, you're just likely to go and show them grace and forgive them and, 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 and give them eternal life, what's worse, and that would really cheese me off. So I'm not going. I'm just not doing it, Lord. How many of you know that God has a way of getting people back on track when they get away from what he's calling to do. And so Jonah goes down to Joppa and pays the fare and he thinks he's going to go to Tarshish and spend some time in Spain for the winter. And you know the story about the storm. He didn't get far from shore before the storm came up threatening to sink the boat and, and the sailors heaved him overboard at his own direction. And then the large fish. We like to say whale, but the Bible says large fish. And you know what happened next? <laughs> this has got to be just rubbing salt into the wound, as it were. The fish vomits him up onto land, onto the beach, the beach that's closest to Nineveh. And I see this pathetic Jonah. This is, this is Jonah who told the king we need to get all of that territory back, and he led the push on that. They got all the territory back. Now, this is Jonah on the beach in whale vomit. Always a few little peas and bits of carrots there, right? He's the stinkiest prophet you're ever going to come across, you know, and God's got him there. What a sight, Jonah on the beach, Jonah on the beach. Jonah 1, 2, uh, preach against the city. Uh, Jonah chapter 3, 1, after he's done, done the, the, the big fish thing and been vomited on the beach, proclaim to the city the message I give you. Uh, Jonah 1, 17, God provided a way back to shore. Jonah 2, 10, uh, God commanded the fish. And the fish took note. Uh, Jonah 3, 1, God commissioned again for the second time. Jonah's attitude, and see, this for us, 
Jonah's attitude to the city of Nineveh was not in sync with God's attitude to the city. And I think most of us are familiar with the story one way or another, uh, how God, uh, commissioning for him for the first time to go to Nineveh, he went down to Joppa, he bought the, paid the fare uh, for the boat from Tarshish uh, to Spain, uh, Tarshish, to Tarshish in Spain. He put the money not in the Sunday offering bucket, he put the money into a fare to take him from where he was supposed to be going in the opposite direction away from the call of God. Actually, 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 see, here's the thing. We think he was running away from Nineveh. We think he was running away from ministry. And sometimes, you know, that we do that. We run away from ministry and we think we're just running away from ministry because we don't want to do it. Maybe the church is talking us into it or we're talking ourselves into it or the people around us are talking us into it. But actually, Jonah was running away from God. And for those who run away from ministry, they may just think they're running away from ministry, but actually they're running away from God. Jonah 1, 2, but Jonah ran away from the Lord. And he headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went on board and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Do you really think you can run away from God? So, well, no, no, I'm just running away from ministry because I don't want to do that anymore. I've done that for a while, and now I want, need to take time off till Christmas, you know. Maybe I'll come back at Christmas. Maybe God won't want you back at Christmas. You're running away from God. Psalm 139, verses 7 to 10. Where can I go from your spirit? Can you really run away from God? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hide me fast. If I go to Tarshish, you'll be there waiting for me. Or you'll find me even before I get to Tarshish. Jonah wasn't just running away from Nineveh or from mission. He was running away from God because he did not like the city of Nineveh or the people of Nineveh. Jonah was angry that God might even consider being gracious to the city of Nineveh and to its people. Jonah chapter 4, verse 1 to 2, when God did not actually bring destruction on Nineveh that Jonah hoped he would, uh, to Jonah this seemed very wrong. He became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish, because I knew that you are a gracious and, gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. In other words, look, Lord, I eventually I did come back to Nineveh, I know, but I knew you would do this. And I preached the message you gave me, turn or burn. I was just hoping they were going to burn. I preached the message, turn or burn. I was just hoping you were going to burn them. I was just hoping you really would, uh, because I really don't like these people. I'm thinking even if they did turn, they would never turn to become like us in our church. In fact, I don't want them to come to our church. They'd stuff our church up. Lord, you know that. You know that. And so I gave the altar call, you know, hoping no one would come forward. Turn or burn, I hope they will burn. But they all turned and came forward. And you poured out your grace and your compassion and your mercy and your love. And I knew you were going to do that. Oh, my youngest grandson, Lawson, he's about to turn nine. He plays tennis every Saturday morning. And so I asked him who his favourite tennis player was. And he said, Roger Federer. And he brought out all these drawings he'd done of him playing with Roger Federer and Roger Federer telling him how good he was. And I said, do you know who Nick Kurios is? He said, who? I said, no, I don't talk about him. He go, oh, you don't talk about him, Roger. And I thought about Nick Kurios because, you know, he's Australian, right? And as Australians, sometimes we want to think, no, he's someone else's, right? Because he goes off, doesn't he? And then I think about uh, 
uh, John McEnroe of yesteryear, you remember him? Uh, and you can find any amount of YouTube clips where he's telling the umpire off, right? But yeah, but he wasn't Australian, he was one of those mad Americans, right? And then I found Pat Cash, the Australian Wimbledon champ, champ everywhere. And, and, and I found this little YouTube clip of Pat Cash telling the umpire off. And, and this, is what, this is what happened, this is what happened. Uh, the person who was serving it was a line ball, but it was just in, and back when Pat Cash and John McEnroe were playing, you didn't have upstairs to get the electronic look on it. it was the umpire was right or wrong. He was always right, even if he was wrong. But they did show the picture later on, and it, it just, just clipped the line. It, it was in, and Pat Cash believed it was out. And he, 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 he told the umpire, he said, you always do this. He named him, whatever his name was. You always do that. I knew you were going to do that. You always call his in when I think it's out. And Jonah's like that. He's going to God, you're the umpire, and you always do that. You call it in, and I know it's out. These people are out, and you're calling it in. And, he, and I'm just as mad as can be that you would do that, God, to these people. Save my people but not that love. Jonah 4.5, uh, Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. See, he's given the altar call and they all came forward. They said, we're giving our lives to God today here and we're going to get our lives right. And Jonah goes, what, what about the burning? And Jonah had gone out, he's sulking now, and sat down at a place east of the city and there he made himself a shelter sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Maybe God will change his mind and burn them after all. Maybe he was just tricking. He, he was still hoping he'd burn Nineveh. And while he was sitting there pouting under his shady shelter, hoping for the worst for this city, uh, the vine that was providing the shady shelter for him withered and died. A worm apparently got at the roots of it. A hot, strong east wind came and burnt off all the leaves. And, and there's Jonah. And now Jonah's not only angry at God for saving the city of Nineveh, he's mad at God for not saving his shelter. Uh, this, this is my shelter, Lord. That, that, that's my shelter. That, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm being, I've got comfortability under this shelter and you got rid of it. And you should have burned the Ninevites, but you didn't. You, burnt my, you went and burnt my shelter. You burnt my shelter. Now there's a lesson here for us. Please be careful, doesn't matter who your people are or where your city is, please be careful about hoping the worst for the city, for the people, when God has a heart for the city. For what you wish for others, good or bad, may come back to bite you, to bless you or curse you. Think about that. Let me give you a verse. Luke chapter 6, verses 37 and 38. Uh, Jesus said, don't judge others and God ju won't judge you. Uh, don't be hard on others and God won't be hard on you. Forgive others and God will forgive you. If you give to others, actually some translations say what you give to others, you'll be given a full amount in return. It will be packed down, shaken together and spilling over into your lap. The way you treat others is the way you will be treated. Now, we, we all love that verse if we think we're getting the good stuff back, right? And, 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 and that's what we'll preach, you know. Be good to others, you get the good stuff back, and it'll be such a good measure. You gave a little bit of good stuff you're going to get back from God, you know, shaken down, pressed together, and it's going to be spilling over into your lap. But that's not what it says. It says if you give bad, you get the bad stuff back, a big load of that in your lap. If you're judgmental to Nineveh, well, then, then you likely to get a whole lot of judgmentalism back right in your lap. The way you treat others is the way that you will be treated, but you'll get a full, fuller measure of it, a full, packed down, overflowing measure. Uh, if, you, if you give graciously to others, then you'll get the overflowing measure of grace back in your lap. Uh, if you treat others judgmentally, you'll get the overflowing measure of judgment back in your lap. And jo Jonah, Jonah wanted judgment and punishment for Nineveh, he wanted to see them burned and punished. And they continued to thrive while his vine did not. While his vine didn't, his shelter 
his comfortability, uh, his vine shriveled and died. Now, church, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. We do not exist as a church or as preachers or evangelists or ministries to tell people how bad they are and how how deserving of punishment they are. My wife, Lyra, has got somewhere between 25 and 30 kids in kids' church this morning. And we talked about her lesson. She wants those kids, primary school kids, not to know how bad they are. Someone else can tell them that along life's lines, yeah. She wants to tell them how gracious and loving and compassionate God is. As a church, as preachers, as evangelists, that's our message. Not how bad anyone is. That, that's too easy. To, we exist and preach to show how gracious God is. That's why our church exists. Wonderful Lord and God. Yeah? Wonderful Lord and God. He's so gracious to each one of us. He, he really is. Regardless of our behavior, regardless of our attitudes, regardless of our sinfulness, uh, he, he wants us to surrender to him so that we will have the Jesus thing going in our lives, on us, in us and around us. And our judgmentalism uh, brings judgment back to ourselves. God has a heart for the city. Yes, he wants to eradicate sinfulness from the city, Uh, That's why he commissioned Jonah to go and preach to Nineveh in the first place. God wants to make proclamation to the city. Jonah 3.2, go to the great city Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Uh, Not not a message uh, of doom. That's that's the one that Jonah wanted, but God didn't say that. The proclamation that Jonah had in mind was the proclamation of doom and condemnation, condemnation where God had in mind to call the people to repentance and receive his grace. And so church, we preach for repentance to receive grace, not judgment and condemnation. <laughs> and see, even, though, even though Jonah's attitude were wrong, actually preaching must have done the job. Uh, the king and the, and the whole city of Nineveh repented and their repentance interacted with the grace and the compassion of God. Jonah 3, 7 to 10, this is the proclamation that the king, in the light of Jonah's preaching, uh, the king, uh, he said, he issued in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth just an old Hessian bag. Uh, let everyone call urgently on God. Uh, let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? Who knows, said the king of Nineveh. God may rel- yet relent and, and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Jonah preached. And the entire city was saved. And that ought to make any preacher, any evangelist, any church, any genuine believer filled with joy. Yeah? But I don't like those people. Well, praise God, he's in touch with them, but not Jonah. Jonah was more concerned about his vine, his little shelter that gave him comfortability, you know, in the, in the hot sun. Uh, what God was concerned about and, and what Jonah was concerned about are two different things. Jonah uh, concerned about a shade plant dying. Jonah wanting to see the city judged, condemned and punished. God, meanwhile, is on about compassion and grace. God concerned for the great city and her people and her animals, by the way. God's heart is for the city. And if we are truly after his heart, as we sang earlier this morning, then our heart will be for the city for the salvation of the city, rather than for the vine, which is our own comfortability and shelter. Jonah chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight, and should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, which there are more than 120,000 people. And by the way, uh, they cannot tell their right hand from their left. That would mean that something isn't as sharp as it might be in, in the shed of tools. 
God says, I'm feeling for them, uh, and, and, and also many animals. This morning, I want to finish this message by praying for our city and for our nation's leaders, our state leaders, our uh, local government leaders, and for their salvation and for the salvation of all people. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 6 uh, I urge then, first of all, uh, that petitions, prayers, intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives. How? In all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. Pray for our city. Pray for our mayor. Uh, pray for our prime minister. Pray for our state premier, local and the state government. By the way, by the way, by the way, on the 19th of October, it's busy bee day here, but it's also local government election day. Now here's the thing. Uh, uh, federal elections, you're voting in those, that's compulsory for you if you're a, if you're, if you're a citizen of this nation. Uh, state government elections, they're compulsory for you if you're a citizen of this nation. Uh, some states have it that local government elections are also compulsory for citizens. WA does not. It's not compulsory, but I just want to encourage you to do it. Check out who... If they're representing you. Why wouldn't you vote for them? Get the right people into local government. Why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you do that? Father in heaven, I, I want to pray for our Prime Minister. Thank you for him. Thank you for him, Father. Thank you that he's a believer. Thank you, Father, that you put alongside him people that can guide him in wisdom. And we're asking, Holy Spirit, that you would be guiding him in wisdom uh, and, and the parliamentarians. And, Father, I want to pray for our state government and, and for our Premier, Mark McGowan. Pray for them, Father, with all the issues they need to deal with, that you would give them wisdom because we're looking for holiness and peace and a good place in which to preach the gospel. That's what you've told us. And, Lord, when it comes to the local government elections, thank you. Thank you for our mayor that served us for, for so long now, Father. And, and I pray for the, concerning the local government elections coming up on the 19th of October. Uh, Father, help us to take our responsibility seriously. And, uh, Father, we pray for those who do lead us in government. But, Father, I want to pray for the city. I want to pray for the city for its peace and prosperity. I want to pray, Father, that our city will be governed in such a way that, yeah, we have the freedom to preach the gospel. We'll see many, many more people come to a place where they surrender their lives to you, Lord Jesus Christ, and find salvation in your name. Thank you for that, Father. And I pray for everyone in this building this morning, Father, some are so sure that they know they're, they're heaven-bound. They know they're on their way to heaven. They've, they've surrendered their lives to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Others here, uh, they're wondering if they really have, whether they've done what, what they needed to do to cross the line, knowing that, that we can do nothing to earn it, but nevertheless we need to surrender. And they're wondering right now, Father, whether they really truly have surrendered. And Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm praying that you would come the way of each individual here and cause them to make it certain this morning. They wouldn't just wonder and worry anymore, uh, that they'd have that, uh, that attitude, Father, that says, I want to say yes to Jesus. And, Father, in saying yes to our Lord Jesus Christ, that we would want the best for our city, have a heart for the city that you have. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father God, in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.